Something very weird happens when you make a transatlantic plane journey. The flight in one direction takes an hour less than the other direction, even between the same two airports. But why? It's not the time zones, so what on earth is going on? The explanation is probably not what you think. I'm Stu, this is Debunked, and we're here to sort the truths from the myths and the facts from the misconceptions. Picture this, you're a British movie obsessive, perhaps with a beard and a tendency to raise one eyebrow. New York City, the backdrop for numerous Hollywood classics, is a must-visit destination. One winter, you hop on an eight-hour transatlantic flight from London. New York City certainly doesn't disappoint. But something about the return journey leaves you perplexed. It took seven hours, one hour less than the outbound flight. You have a cursory look at flight times on the internet, and it turns out it wasn't just you. Commercial flights that cover the 3,400-mile, 5,600-kilometer journey from New York to London are usually a good hour shorter than the same journey in the opposite direction. You ponder this as you wait for your luggage to arrive, and as you approach the carousel, a wailing toddler drops an oversized plushy toy onto the moving belt. The familiar figure of Paddington Bear grows larger and larger as it approaches you, and you feel an idea strike you so hard that you wonder if your fellow passengers can see the light bulb. The Earth's rotating surface must act like the carousel, you think moving your destination towards you as you fly towards it. But wait, that doesn't make any sense. The Earth rotates from west to east, the same direction as your flight. There's no way London could have been rotating towards your plane. By the time you've boarded the bus heading home, you're chewing on an additional problem. The idea of a destination traveling towards or away from an observer on the same planet seems a bit iffy, regardless of direction. A thought experiment. If you'd stood on the carousel just in front of Paddington and jumped straight up in the air, would Paddington pass underneath you? No. Though you and Paddington would have moved relative to a stationary observer in the arrivals hall, your positions on the belt remain the same. Newton's first law, also known as the law of inertia, helps explain this. When I jump directly upwards, I retain the forward motion of the carousel. My airborne body, already moving at the carousel speed, continues to move at this speed, in the direction of travel. Thus, relative to Paddington, who is also moving with the carousel, you don't move backwards or forwards. You both continue moving together with the carousel. It's kind of similar with a plane on Earth. A Harrier jump jet can't simply raise into the air and wait for the Earth to rotate under it until its destination approaches. The speed of the Earth rotation at New York City is about 790 miles per hour, or 1,270 kilometers per hour. If, for the sake of argument, our jump jets were sitting on the runway at JFK, the Earth's surface, the Earth's atmosphere, and the jump jet would also be rotating west to east at 790 miles per hour. As it rises upwards, the jump jet retains the Earth's rotational velocity and rotates with the Earth's surface and its atmosphere in the same direction. On a perfectly still day, relative to a stationary observer on the ground who is also rotating west to east in the direction of the Earth's rotation at 790 miles per hour, the jet hovers above the same spot of land. When it fires its thrusters, it's capable of approaching its destination at its top speed of about 660 miles per hour at sea level, in any direction. We're back to square one then. Where on earth did that hour go? The answer is hidden in a sneaky caveat of the jump jet thought experiment. The Earth's atmosphere is never perfectly still. In fact, at the altitude at which passenger jets fly, the winds can be very strong indeed. In the Northern Hemisphere, where the flight path between New York City and London is located, there is a high-altitude fast-moving air current moving around the globe from west to east, a very strong wind known as a jet stream. So far, so good. But why would the winds up there constantly be blowing in the same direction? Like all winds, which are moving air masses, jet streams are ultimately driven by differences in temperature and pressure between regions. We mentioned earlier that the speed of the Earth's rotation at New York City is about 790 miles per hour. At the equator, it's considerably faster, while at the poles, it's a lot slower. 
To make this a little clearer, imagine a turntable spinning a vinyl record. Now draw a straight line from the center to the edge. Put a penny at each end of the line, one at the center and one at the edge. You'll notice that although both pennies move through a full 360 degrees in the time a single rotation takes, the path followed by the penny at the edge is considerably longer. It's a bit like this with any point on the Earth. Each point on the Earth's surface completes a full rotation in the same period of time, 24 hours. Being a sphere, the Earth's circumference, that is, a circular path around the Earth at any given latitude, varies. It's smaller near the poles and largest at the equator. A point on the equator has to rotate through a much larger distance in 24 hours than a point near the poles. It follows, then, that the speed of rotation is highest at the Earth's equator and lowest near the poles. You'll no doubt be aware that surface temperatures are considerably higher in regions close to the equator than they are in polar regions. As the air at the equator is heated, it rises and, in the northern hemisphere, begins to move towards the far cooler North Pole. At higher latitudes, the circumference of the Earth is smaller, and so is the radius of the circle corresponding to that circumference. As air moves from the equator towards the smaller radius of the poles, it retains its higher eastward velocity from the equator, where the speed of the Earth's rotation is fastest. Because this speed decreases at higher latitudes, this difference in velocity makes the air curve to the right in the northern hemisphere, a phenomenon known as the Coriolis effect. To understand this in a real-world sense, we can demonstrate a short practical experiment that you can try out at home. We'll return to the turntable of our record player, this time with a blank circle of paper. We'll use a ruler to show what the path would look like if the air travelled directly from the equator to the North Pole, and we'll use this marker to show you the kind of path the air actually follows due to the reduced circumference and rotation of the Earth. You can explore the Coriolis effect in more depth with our educational partner, Brilliant. Click on my link in the description to find out more. In the Northern Hemisphere, this leads to a generally eastward movement of air mass, rather than a direct northward movement. This eastward movement of air is what causes the jet stream. As you can see from this animation, the jet stream isn't bullet straight. It's more like a meandering river than a canal. In addition to the deflection of air masses due to the Earth's rotation, as we've already discussed, the characteristic wavy appearance of the jet stream is caused by the interaction between air masses of differing temperatures and densities. The warmer, less dense tropical air rises, while the colder, denser polar air sinks, leading to the formation of waves in the jet stream. The sharp temperature gradients at the boundaries of these air masses cause the jet stream to form in narrow concentrated bands. So, it it's this jet stream, specifically the polar jet stream, which is located at around 60 degrees latitude in the Northern Hemisphere, that offers the key to our transatlantic time travel mystery. Pilots flying from New York to London can harness this powerful high-altitude wind to boost their speed over ground, significantly cutting down on flight time. Just as a swimmer might use the current to help them move faster in a river, planes can enter the jet stream to take advantage of its rapid eastward flow. The jet stream we're talking about here isn't the only one. The Southern Hemisphere has a polar jet stream of its own, at a latitude of around 60 degrees south. Jet streams aren't limited to polar regions either. In the Northern Hemisphere, the polar jet stream can influence weather patterns as far south as around 50 degrees latitude, known as the mid-latitude region. And in both hemispheres, they also occur closer to the equator, at about 30 degrees latitude. These are known as subtropical jet streams. When flying west to east, pilots adjust their routes to intersect with the jet stream, allowing the aircraft to be propelled faster towards its destination. This might actually mean they cover a slightly longer distance, but the increased speed offered by the jet stream more than makes up for the detour, resulting in shorter overall flight times. When flying in the opposite direction, pilots may seek routes that avoid the strongest parts of the jet stream to prevent it from slowing them down. This could mean flying at different altitudes or taking a path that steers clear of the most powerful wind currents. The phenomenon that perplexed our totally hypothetical British movie enthusiast is, it turns out, a perfect illustration of how human ingenuity has learned to work with the natural forces of our planet. If you enjoyed learning about the complex concept of the Coriolis effect, then you can continue your educational journey for free with the Brilliant Platform. 
Their course on vectors makes intricate mathematical problems easy to follow and solve. It allows you to play with concepts like this, an approach that has proved to be six times more effective than watching lecture videos. With Brilliant, you can develop your problem-solving skills by learning how basic scientific principles and math equations can be applied to solve puzzles and complete games relating to the world around you. You can tailor your learning journey to your own skill level by taking a quick quiz when you sign up, and you'll be matched with content that fits your current skill level and interests. But before you know it, you'll be mastering concepts that you thought were unachievable before. So instead of doom scrolling through social media when you have five minutes spare, why not make use of that time and exercise your brain? To try everything Brilliant has to offer, free for a full 30 days, scan the QR code on screen now, visit brilliant.org forward slash debunked, or click on my link in the description. Plus, you'll get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.